I wonder. I know it's a conspiracy, mm-hmm. but yeah, if it's like until, if it was it's a, always a conspiracy when like if businesses are being paid, you know, if like the pigs are actually doing the break ins, then the businesses are being paid to like post about this type of shit. Some of them. Oh, it's you know? for sure. I would say it's a combination. You know, I mean the same thing if it's about driving up fear, driving up unrest, and trying to push people to a more pro police politic pro police funded politic you feel me especially in the wave of 2020 from the defund police and then you had a, a libby shad being ousted and then a, a pseudo progressive like shane tao come in yeah. under the guise of oh even though we know that shane tao is like a joe biden is going to put more police on the streets is going to fund more academies is going to support the police but you know try and act like a progressive this is part of that wave you feel me yeah. to where it is for show sure. for show sure, uh you know quote unquote crime is happening but you know what I'm saying? It ain't uh, <laughs> shit ain't happening. So it ain't a conspiracy. When you look in the protests that was happening, and the police would be in there trying to instigate things, the police in uh, protests pulling out guns on protesters, undercover police doing that to protesters. So it's yeah. like it's part of it is yeah, for sure, for sure is. Conspiracies, uh huh. I mean, some might call it so. I just historically, there are no. I've, the state leaves no stone unturned as it pertains to any methods or frameworks or. We know actions. a counterinsurgency right now. Yeah. Is happening from a media standpoint. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah we we seeing that for that's a fact, especially coming up in the 2024. So how are they doing this? You know, especially on Instagram, like if we understand the algorithms, if we understand these pages, these fake pages, you know, what, what was that fake page that was talking about all the, uh, I don't know, all like the rap beef and shit and street shit. Oh, yeah. Um, the YouTube shit. Yeah. Well, like, we don't even got to say their yeah. name. Just I, I don't can't even. remember. But you know what shit. I'm saying? So like that type of police work being done already, you know what I'm saying? That was happening. Well, that was happening. Like it's always been happening to some degree. They still, yeah, they still be doing that type of swamp story. Sw- you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that was what it was called. So it was you having that, but then you now you have these, you know, Instagram accounts that are just only reporting crime, but talking about like Bay Area culture or Oakland culture. They're one, but like that you type feel of me? Yeah. And you'll be, yeah, um, that's a whole other episode. <laughs> <laughs> this is our 105th episode. 145th. 145th. I'm sorry. 145th. 145th. Our 145th episode. Well, man, we travel back and saw. <laughs> Hella Black, man. Go to our Patreon, patreon.com slash Pod. SoundCloud, soundcloud.com. You know what I'm saying? Hella Be the black. one person, the one person. Okay, we get, in our first day on SoundCloud, we usually get like a thousand listens or something like that. Be the one person that sends this to somebody and say, yo, you should give these people $5 to support their podcast. Patreon.com backslash Hella Black Pod. We need it. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, you feel me? Tap in, and as support always, the people. If you can't doing do that, the work, uh, at least forward it to somebody. The po- actual podcast, yeah. if they can't put on Patreon, just you know, listen. And I'm a, uh, like subscribe. Yeah, forward it to a friend. But I'm a challenge. I'm a challenge some of our loyal listeners who have definitely sent it to their friends. I challenge you to go up to some. <laughs> this is like the diversity and inclusion shit. <laughs> you know when they be doing facilitation. I challenge you to go outside, talk to a stranger, ask them how they doing. And ask them if they heard of Hell Black Podcast. And if they haven't, tell them to tap in that they think and you think they'd like the show. We got some, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to lie. We have like a few people who have commented. I'll, let's go back to like July. We have uh, some really dope responses and rates. It's cool. I haven't got a chance to, to tell you this. Um, but yesterday, I was at a volleyball game and a parent came up to me and was like, hey, you do Tales of the Town, right? I'm like, yeah. And. She might be listening to this. I don't know. She might She might only like Tales of the Town, so she might not even be listening to uh, the rest of our stuff. But um, she was saying how Tales of the Town all last winter got her through her mother's death. She was like, man. So she would, her and her father would listen to it uh, every day as they took walks. Yeah, so I bring that up because we also have, like, some kind words from other folks that read the podcast, from, from other folks that listen and support the podcast. And... I'm sure y'all are tired of hearing this around like uh, how hard it is 
to be consistent with this podcast. Uh, and so I think hearing y'all responses and appreciating our work is super dope. Like you have someone, uh, let's, like I said, going back to July, these dudes tell it like it is with a nice blend of straight talk and elevated language. This is truly some conversation you'll want to listen to and participate in. Uh, inspired to revisit all the texts mentioned here. Appreciate the sincerity, the lightheartedness, and the clarity of action. May your collective work receive its due reward. And for us, that's liberation, free to land. Inshallah. Uh, I've been listening to this show since the first episode. Hey, so you've definitely seen the growth. You've seen the growth <laughs> and the evolution, yeah. man. Come on. Uh, it constantly inspires me to learn and challenge myself. If you're not listening to Hella Black, then what are you doing? I love this show. I have learned so much and really enjoy it. Uh, I've been listening to Hella Black for about a year now, and their pure knowledge and clear messages have made me such a more mindful and a aware human being. Uh, there are so many ways to change your, uh, in parentheses, our behavior and thinking to support and uplift the new African community that Hella Black brings to the audience's attention. This podcast will forever change your values, morals, actions, and, for, and actions forever. Uh, it will vote your empathy, anger, desire, love into a stratosphere that you could never imagine. Listen now, man, that's big love. Appreciate you. Dope. Especially because yeah. you and I, I feel like we spend so much time on the podcast, but also like privately uh, talking about the impact that certain texts or speeches or films have had on us. And to know that, you know, we are able to do that for people in the name of, you know, uh, trying to change humanity from a exploitative, oppressive, uh, society into one that's you know communal equal where we all have our basic needs met and can uh spend more time uh not just trying to survive and i hate people you know i think it's been watered down when you say survive not thrive but like I actually mean that you know and for us that means changing our relationship to the means of production changing our relationships to property changing our relationship to self like there are real material things that we would like to see uh and so the fact that this podcast that we are able to do maybe once or twice a month is helping raise the conscience of the people and we understand that that raising of consciousness to be like the first step to actually materially changing the world i'm grateful man um it makes me feel like all the study and the work that we're doing is, is worth it because all that ain't gonna happen without if you've been listening since episode one you've seen the growth from us just talking and rambling to actually trying to provide an analysis and uh, shape consciousness so yeah thank y'all for supporting better sound quality Better ideology, hey. <laughs> better people. You know what I'm saying? So shout out to everybody who's been supporting. Appreciate everybody who's doing these reviews. You know, because for us to, uh, you know, we put a lot of time into this, and, uh, and you know, we might be uh, one episode a month sometimes, or three or four. You know what I'm saying? But trust that we're always doing the work. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like when we said we put a lot of time into this. It ain't just about the podcast, as y'all know. It's about the program. The podcast ain't bigger than the program <laughs> You know what I'm saying So we working day in and day out Organizing you know so Support Hella Black Support people's programs You know go to our Patreon Patreon.com slash Hella Black Pod But we got a very Timely episode mm -hmm. I would say For sure Especially in terms of the local terrain The media terrain And a lot of this hysteria On um, "Quote unquote crime in Oakland," and I say "quote unquote crime" for a variety of reasons that we'll we'll get into. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, things are happening without a doubt in the streets. It's not to deny any of that, uh, but the way crime, "quote unquote crime," has been politicized uh, by the local government, politicized by local news stations, politicized by these corporations, uh, is definitely rooted in the ongoing genocide. Of new African people, I know that's a lot to start off with. So I mean, we're gonna I, break it down <laughs> for yeah. sure. But you know, I just wanted to kind of get your, uh, yeah. Well, how you feeling about this? Well, I mean, you mentioned for us, this is a national thing, but uh, right now we're seeing it super elevated as it pertains to Oakland, uh, and so I recognize it as a ploy to strengthen the police state nationally, uh, especially as you look at the responses around like, you know, theft against, uh, let's take like retail stores, for example. Um, and we can use Target as a, a national example because they have, I'll use two cities, for example, Oakland and Harlem, right? And so in Oakland, you know, they're closing one in downtown Oakland. 
Uh, but I seen an article where it was like management has misreported the numbers on theft, right? Then in Harlem, you had a, a site saying like, okay, we're closing this because of all the theft. But seven blocks down the street, they're keeping one open and that spot actually has more theft than this one. Uh, and so when you take that in collaboration with Biden's push for like these uh, public safety training centers, where you could, which are really just like police training centers, which are really cop cities, like you see being happening in Atlanta. When you take all these things uh, in collaboration, I have to recognize it, whether you're talking about the over sensationalism from some of these uh, local pages that we see in Oakland, whether you see uh, these national stories around having to, close re re having to close retail stores, but then the uh, false reports on data just to create a narrative, and then that in collaboration with these different cop cities that are happening around uh, the nation, including one in San Pablo, which for those that aren't familiar with uh, the Bay Area, San Pablo is probably about 20 minutes away from North Oakland, uh, a little city between um, El Cerrito and Richmond, right? El Cerrito and Richmond? Yeah, El Cerrito and Richmond. Um, and so they're building a like $40 million uh, police training center. It's like a smaller, like a mini cop city because cop city is on acres and acres of land, right? Uh, but you have yeah, this, this national push to strengthen the police state. Um, so, I mean, it, we use in police state, so I think it also helps to give them a definition. And then, you know, give your take on it. Yeah, I mean, if we look at the police state, we look at the foundation of the United States of America as a settler colonial plantation, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And a police state is defending the interests of that settler colonial plantation, right? So we see these uh, police officers, you know, in the South, there were uh, slave patrollers. In the North, there was busting up unions, uh, as well as, you know, stealing and slave, uh, Africans who got their freedom and ran away, right? Uh, so we understand the police state as essentially uh, the guardian. The police is the guardians of capitalism. They're the guardians of uh, settler colonialism. They're the uh, guardians and uh, protectors of the corporate interests in the United States of America. They only protect capital. That's what they for. You call the police. <laughs> they don't prevent crime. They come after. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They, they, they ain't about quote unquote prevention. It's about protecting capital, right? So when you talk about uh, a cop city and you know I understand the the slogan of cop city it's like an easy slogan to get with but if we really are, you know looking at what's happening right You're now saying stop cop city like, yeah, like the, slogan? the slogan of like stop cop city uh -huh. you know it's like I understand it right I understand the slogan but in reality these are military bases being established with the <laughs> efforts or with the with the goal of deploying <laughs> military occupation forces into new African communities. That's really what's going on right now. You feel me? So we're seeing this uh, quote unquote discussions of crime being politicized in a very similar way as the tough on crime era to do what? To then say, oh, we need to invest in these military bases because <laughs> that's what they are. Military training hubs. Uh, in quote unquote new African urban communities to be able to deploy their forces into the community because they know what's about to come. They know what's coming with these economic shifts across the world. They also understand that these police officers, and you hear it from like people in the military all the time, like, you, you know, and it's not a great example because the military shouldn't <laughs> be doing what they're doing because of imperialism, right? But people in the military will come on about, man, these police officers, they don't know shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, oh man, they just, they some suckers. Like, you know, you hear that from people. And that's, there's a truth in that because they, a lot of them are very undertrained. You know what I'm saying? When it comes to uh, urban warfare, <laughs> when it comes to the, the the traffic stops, when it comes to like what is about to come home, if we're predicting a civil war at some point is coming, the average police B cop, we call him a pig for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying. Like they, they pigs. You know what I'm saying. They are under trained. So what are they doing? They're trying to train them up for what the eventuality of what's about to happen to this, in this country. Mm -hmm. You know. So this is uh, uh, the same way they establish, in a similar way they establish Africom and bases on the continent. What they're doing now is they're establishing uh, more military bases within the settler colony. It's a domestic approach to what it's they the do domestic, internationally. You feel me? Mm -hmm. They're having drones. They've dropped bombs in the, historically. Mm -hmm. 
uh, we see AI, we see technology being used by the police to be able to do whatever they want to do. So it's a, a direct relation into the reporting yeah. and into the funding. You know what I'm saying? We see how much Biden is funding the police, how much Biden is funding the military. You have to create a hysteria around it. Oh, I'm unsafe at all times. Oh, the police make me safe. You feel me? It's like the their approach. You feel me? It's, yeah. it's like shit. It's they science. <laughs> That's create high hysteria, mm-hmm. create panic, create fear, and then we say, okay, we need police. We need funding. We need cop cities. We need training centers. To pr- we're trying to protect you. We're realistic. We know they're not. It's <laughs> what's wild is how they can they can engineer your participation in your own demise, right? Like we know here in Oakland that the uh, I believe, give or take, this is that the annual budget uh, for the OPD since 2020 is I think between like 358 to 360 million dollars, uh, and it's actually increased um, since 2020 where you had the old defund the pigs and whatnot, right? But I believe like 360, like 358 and 362 are like the numbers that come to my mind as far as annual annual budget, and this is without overtime. Knowing that, uh, I think last year alone they did 61 million in overtime, right? But knowing these, knowing this data, um, that they have annually a budget over over 350 million dollars, and they haven't been able to address crime. Like, how much more money do they need? And this is the same place where they're saying, "Oh, defund the police," or "We're going to defund OPD." But Oakland police funding has increased by 18 percent since 2020. What's the annual, or does it say that it's the annual? Uh, it's like three. In the 2022 to 2023 fiscal year, the department's budget is 374 million. But since 2020, it's increased 18. Yeah. percent So we're here in 2023. <laughs> People are still saying more police, but even if that is the solution, there's been quote unquote more funding for it, more funding done for it. And what has happened? Quote unquote more quote unquote property crime. But the real realistically, uh, like homicide's been down. Yeah, I believe 14. percent So you have to ask yourself, okay. Again, they engineer your participation in your own demise. We recognize, look at all these strikes that's happening right now. Some of it, of course, you know, uh, the Democratic Party is able to uh, co-opt and engineer and and make their own. But you look at, Kaiser just had the largest strike, uh, wasn't like healthcare history or some shit like that. Nationally, they had hundreds of thousands of Kaiser workers walking out. I read something where it was saying, like, this is the largest strike in history, right? Uh, in the in the healthcare field, and so then you just had Hollywood coming off a strike, right? Like workers, auto workers, because of capitalism, workers create it creates the conditions where workers uh, there reach it reaches a boiling point where the cost of living is just too much is a lot higher than what wages are affording people, right? Uh, and so this is just going to happen again because what capitalism is still existing. Yeah, you have this reform, but in five more years this thing is going to happen, mm-hmm. in six more years this thing is going to happen, and that's how the government. It's planning yeah. on both an international and domestic scale. And so they recognize that the contradictions yeah. will reach a boiling point like they did in 2020, where you have disease, where you have shit, slight famine because people don't have money to buy things. And then you have police killing because of these increase in police budgets and increase of pigs on the street. And so what happens when there's a cop city in Atlanta and there's, and there, there, like you said, these military bases in Atlanta, these military bases in San Pablo, these military bases in Milwaukee? What happens when, you, when, when the people up uh, rise up and it's what happens to, when they rise cool. up in a quote unquote uncontrolled matter right because these strikes are a controlled matter right it ain't a, that's what I'm saying like you feel me? It's where, a where it was when you saw people really destroying strategic. property you feel really me? destroying like, property and looting and you feel me and mass what happens numbers. from a, a Marxist jargon what, ha- or what happens when the streets rise up versus when the worker you feel me you want to be able to neutralize what it a was lot easier. Happen? Where you had weeks, of and these then you protests. actually might even have the workers saying nah to the people in the streets, "Hey man, what you doing?" <laughs> so that worker now becomes a part of that counterinsurgent strategy. Mm-hmm. You know, it's say, a full pronged approach. You know, it's like a real encirclement tactic, real bro. encirclement tactic on both an ideological scale and then actually um, on a like physical material reality where you have. These different small bases that are going to be set up, and then you have these different agencies, state agencies like CHP, which is deploy more officers, mm-hmm. uh, which have the Oakland, ability to actually uh, deploy it on the streets into the neighborhoods yeah. and stuff. Right, right. So like this is just you got to actually this is going to be serious, bro. Yeah. 
One thing capitalism is masterful at is what you were saying is that containment. Mm -hmm. You feel me? Like, they can manage crises very well, and they engineer crises very well to serve their own political objective of what's about to come. You feel me? As rising rents, as rising costs of living, as rising costs to just literally, you feel me, survive as a human being from food and water, as all those things rise, you feel me, and people's wages aren't being increased, and then we're having this... uh, you know, the, the, the quote unquote welfare state isn't doing what it's, you know what I'm saying? Isn't providing people the bare resources that they need. What's going to happen? Go, and also because what's me? going on internationally. And we've seen the international shifts and contradictions happening with uh, the establishment of BRICS and mm-hmm. a multipolar world happening, right? So you look at what happened with some of these strikes, I would say they're managing this crisis in a certain way because of what's about to come in the future. So if you, you feel me, get the masses of unions on board with you, like you have Joe Biden. You feel me joining the picket line? We have the. (laughs) You you feel me? We have the master chief joining the highest ranking official in the United States of America joining the picket line. Because what happens? Because you sit down with the union workers and you tell them, "Look, it. We want to give you all this higher wage, but because of the relationship between France and Niger and NATO, we just can't." And China and Russia. So if you want us, if you want this, we got to go over there and take this uranium. We got to take this bauxite. We gotta take this tantalum. We so gotta I, take this cobalt, and it's gonna be by war. So I'll give you these four dollars, five dollars increase in wages. But when that happens, you know y'all still gotta work. When the war happens, y'all, gotta y'all still it. gotta support it. And y'all gotta work and make more tanks on the picket line, right? So this is part of that uh, control containment strategy for like when that contradiction reaches itself again, which is going to happen. You feel me? The same thing we see when Michael Brown. The same thing we've seen with George Floyd. Right, so when the next big moment happens, the workers are more tied into the state. The quote unquote proletariat is more aligned with the state versus being aligned with the people, versus being aligned with the revolution, versus being aligned with new African independence. I mean look at the our, We could look at my family. My family got <laughs> jobs at the long at the port when what happened? When the white working class got shipped off to war. That was our integration into the into the into the uh, longshoreman shit, you know? Like War is big business, and if you are able to benefit, uh, you know, what we consider the domestic neo colony here in the so-called United States, uh, in order for you to get something, in order for them to give you something, asking who they're taking from, it's going to be uh, folks on the continent, folks in Latin America, right? And what they doing right now with over Eastern Africans. Europe? What they doing over now in Eastern Europe? You know, and it's a part of you feel me. Jail is big business. They want people on the street so that the way they can take people to jail. Man, they want to essentially they want Ukraine to be destroyed so that international finance capital can go into Ukraine and rebuild Ukraine and make billions and trillions of dollars. That's what they're doing. Okay, we'll give you these bullets. We'll give you these guns. But when the time comes for us to now build these new contracts with these multinational corporations to, you feel me, rebuild Ukraine and make all this money, that's what's, you feel me, all this is a part Look at, of, man. of the interests of the United States of America and pan-Europeanism. I don't, like, I don't want war for anybody, period. Straight You're talking up. about millions of people dying? I don't want that. But ask yourself why they have given Ukraine billions of dollars. Why have they have given it? Billions and billions and billions of dollars to police forces worldwide or uh, across the country. And there have been nothing in terms of uh, what the money they're giving to Ukraine. People in the, in, in the so-called America could have been eating for free. Free rent. Free health care. Free education. Ask yourself how they keep finding all these. That's all we have to ask. Like, what is the true cause of crime? Yeah. What makes a person... Risk your life in their life in a home invasion. What makes a person risk their life breaking into a car to steal your backpack? That's not just some. What uh, makes a person get under your car to take your catalytic to take converter. your catalytic converter, knowing damn well that that chainsaw is gonna wake up half of the neighborhood? What makes a person take these risks that go against all logic, dire situations? They they, they try to create, and that's the thing about this reporting around crime. Um, that we've been getting at is did you take this back to the uh, the Sambo and the uh, 
What's the other image of the black man? The brute. The brute. What's the one they used to chase the white girl through the through the, through the uh, like in the silent films and shit? It's not the it's not the brute. Is it the brute? No, the brute is like the big black nigga that saves him, or is it the big black uh, the big, who chase him? Big black nigga who's chasing him. You feel okay. me? Like that like stereotypical hypersexualized strong. This, you feel me? But this is go this goes back to creating a specific type of image a caricature. Of, of you know like a, a yeah. black youth, the nigga in a ski mask that a. That's what that's what you need to be afraid of when you go outside. The little niggas in ski masks that run around and gonna take whatever from you. It's creating that narrative, right? So that when something happens to these people, you don't feel nothing. Versus mm-hmm. asking yourself, what makes a human put his life at risk and put your life at risk? Is are we just uh, we don't come out the, the we don't come out the womb this way? Mm-hmm. Some of these kids, bro, Man, they, they got to kill you in the media first. They got to kill you to justify, they, to justify it. it all. Oh. This is the reverse Trayvon Martin shit. When you wait till he did, you post a picture of the gun. Now I'm gonna show you with them with the guns right now. So we can justify it, but like act, these kids didn't come out committing robberies. Yeah, <laughs> literally. These kids come out. We I spend times at youth football games. All I've been at every weekend. I'm at a youth football game, but these kids is is I I play youth sports. You feel me? We don't come out this way, bro. But that's what welfare and section eight to do to you. You feel me? That's what uh, living in West Oakland, where you are victims. Uh, public health disparities and environmental racism living in Hunter's Point. You feel me? Like, this is what happens to you. No human being with them ask people with jobs, well, some of them, because what it says is uh, I think somewhere of uh, 50% of people in shelters uh, work full or part time or some shit like that. So I can't even say ask people with jobs they commit robberies because some, some of them are. They have to. But any person with all their essential needs met, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, people love referring to, if you got bread, water, food, shelter, housing, health care, ask themselves if you, if you out there committing robberies. No. Youth unemployment rate sky high. Regular unemployment rate sky high. Shit. Wages been stagnant since 1979. What are we talking about here, bro? But you want to blame individuals for are humans supposed to just crawl in the corner and die? And again, I think that you've already stated that at the beginning. This is, I live in Oakland, bro. I've been bipped. I've had the cat. I've been bipped three times. Had the catalytic converter taken. They had the catalytic converter taken on our mobile health clinic. But we would be wrong to come up here and say that the police will solve this. We'll be wrong. We we will be wrong, bro. You know what I'm saying so. Like, yes, I mean, we have a real problem, but let's get oh, yeah. to some real solutions. Bro. Even for the you know person who might not have no consciousness, just think about it. This shit happened to you. What are you gonna do? You call the police. Are they are they gonna come? No. They're going to laugh at you. Is the city going to support you? No. Is the government going to support you? No. So let's actually create solutions for the people. And for us, it comes through programs for decolonization. (laughs) Right? So thinking about just all this media frenzy, all this uh, social media frenzy, and this hysteria around crime, you know, I think a lot of it kind of culminated in this, uh, what some might call a protest. Mm-hmm. Uh, others might call a counterinsurgent tactic being led by uh, certain businesses. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Uh, trying to frame it a certain type of way, and you know, but uh, <laughs> how you feel about you know this this protest that took place in Oakland of quote unquote local business owners. Over, you know, it's reported that over 200 local business owners yeah. went on strike for two magical hours in protest of crime. What's your thoughts on that, man? It's a layer situation, so I'm gonna try my best not to speak in absolutes because, you know, there, I'm sure there is some truth to certain businesses being impacted. You know, like, uh, do I really want to go? Do I really want to go down there? This might happen. Do I really like? You feel me? I'll be some some places. I'll just like I'm an Uber down here. I ain't gonna risk, but everybody might not have that ability. So, I think there is some fairness to what's going on. Um, but again, I, there is a lot of misinformation being spread, it's even around with the, what you just uh, spoke to in terms of the number of businesses that participated. You know, there were I've seen reports of uh, businesses being on the list, and I'm saying like we weren't even involved. Then you've seen different folks who were going around taking pictures, like okay, this person's name is on the list, and they're actively open right now. Then you had situations where there was a restaurant who said okay. You know, the strike was, I think, from 10 to 1230 and a restaurant put their name on the list, but they don't even open to 1130 or 10 to 12. But this restaurant didn't even open to 1130. So, like, you protesting for 30 minutes. You feel me? Like, uh, um, 
So yeah, I understand some of the sentiment because we've been talking about this is a very real thing. Like my grandma live in this community. My nieces and nephews live in this community. My siblings live in this community. I live in this community. And so, yeah, I do want us to be able to go outside and, uh, you know, feel, feel quote unquote, I don't know how safe one can feel. Under colonialism. <laughs> you feel me? But, land. Uh, it goes back to the last point. I think we got to just be real clear about what the causes of this state of emergency is. You know, like. Folks keep saying there's crime happening, crime happening, but what is the real cause? And we've already spoke to this. Like when you deal with a system where certain people get to decide all aspects of your life, right? Because of their relationship to the means of production, meaning the land, the technologies, the natural resources, right? And if we taste it in this in this country specifically, it all goes back to the transatlantic slave trade and to the Berlin Conference, right? Where they took the colonial approach to uh, Africa. Then it goes back to World War II and the establishment of NATO and United Nations and this neo-colonial, right? Like, let's talk about that. Most people, this isn't just coming out of a vacuum. What's going on in Oakland today is a manifestation of uh, centuries of capitalist exploitation and the material reality that this economic system and political system creates. And until we get there, we'll keep having these... uh, Again, I will say, like, it's part of it is justified. Like, if you are a business, you're, like, trying to make it, like, damn. If I go to some of these businesses and, like, you well, look out the window, a motherfucker is getting bipped. You know, like, I came outside of business, my shit got bipped. But, again, it won't be fixed until you get the real cause, right? But these people are, again, I would, can, I would say uh, victims of misinformation and victims of mass media propaganda. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, how do we get a situation where... There's a specific business owner. I won't say brother's name because I'm not really too familiar with like uh, you motherfucker might claim doxing or all this type of shit. So I'm just gonna stay away from it. But there's a specific business owner who, you know, used to run a business in Oakland. I believe they closed the restaurant in Oakland. And you know, t- three years ago, this person was saying, "I feel in, at, during the uprisings as a result of George Floyd and uh, Breonna Taylor." And you know, one of the reasons why this business also closed was because he claimed that oh, I couldn't get enough people. I couldn't get people to work for me. Probably because of wages, right? But that's another story. We've already we've already gave y'all our take on wages. You feel me? Like y'all get it where we go here, right? But this person in 2020 was saying, you know, I feel like I feel unsafe around all these police, right? We just said that as it pertains to OPD's budget, they've received an 18% increase, which allows them to put more pigs on the street, put more resources into the pigs. Now, three years later, you're claiming there needs to be an increase in police. What what makes a person change their mind when the p- the pigs have killed more people since twenty twenty since twenty twenty? The pigs are getting more money since twenty twenty. The actual conditions that you refer to of feeling unsafe have it actually, as it pertains to police, have uh, increased. Some of the things like homicide and other violent crimes have decreased, right? But you just have all these crimes against property. Ask yourself, what are the real causes? And what are the real solutions? It's not it's not the police, right? And so I consider the protest again on Monday or whatever we that was like two Mondays ago, I think. I consider that to be a byproduct of a misled people uh, who don't have a true analysis on the historical development of their city uh, and especially their nation um, and really the global arena. And, you know, I hope that this podcast can help to get us to start to ask some of the real questions because I believe you and I are two people who are actually invested in the well-being of Oakland, you know? Um, and I think there are other people. I do think some of those people who probably protest, they do have Oakland, the best the best interests of they Oakland. They do have legitimate world, reasons you know? to For want, sure. thing, want change, right? But I think what you're saying, again, is like part of like the psychological operation of it, you feel me? And then if you're uh, uneducated and uh, not conscious to what's really going on, these other factors that are driving it, right? It's easy to become reactionary. Uh, it's easy to just respond to, okay, yeah, I am going to protest, not realizing that, you know, this protest has certain aims. A, more police, right? You've seen signs from these protests talking about the National Guard declaring a state of emergency in Oakland, right? Have we not learned what's happened when the National the Guard is deployed 
in new African communities? Do you think having the United States so-called army just hanging out on the streets is going to be good? What do we think is actually going to happen? So we want to spend millions of dollars, millions upon millions of dollars deploying more police, deploying the army. Is that the solution? Or is it free housing? Or is it health care? Would it make a person get behind or the is police it food? but be opposed to free housing? Like, don't that like, kind of that, that is just That's brain? a prison, bro. Right? It's a prison of way of thinking. Like, we spend, <laughs> we're taxed, and then millions upon millions of our tax dollars are going to people who don't solve any of these issues. When you call, you know what I'm saying? Like, even if you say they do solve them, they don't. <laughs> you call them and what happens? They don't show up. I'm not saying call them, but I'm saying let's deal with the actual facts of the response time, quote unquote. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, let's be real. That, that, that ain't the solution. The people will always be the solution until the people decide we want a better way of life. <laughs> And realize that the state is not the one that will ever give us a better way of life. That's a fact. We've seen it historically. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So what are we going to do? Are we going to continue to have this mind state that that this white man going to save us? Or the black pig. (laughs) That the black pig going to save us. (laughs) That the the Asian mayor going to save us. You feel me? The system ain't going to save us. The people deciding, no, we want a system that actually benefits the masses of our people and not billions of dollars being invested into prisons, not billions and trillions of dollars being invested into the military, but actually a, a investment into the people where we can be able to determine our own destiny. Personally, you know, last thing I'll say on kind of uh, a point that I really want to drive home is that I know that it don't matter how many pigs is on the street. It don't matter what uh, National Guards and CHP, even the Army itself, uh, people ain't going to crawl into a corner and die. <laughs> you feel me? So what y'all going to see is people fighting back by any means necessary. By any means necessary. So I can tell you the police ain't going to solve this issue. The police are not going to install fear into someone who's at their wits end and still has the ability to rationalize life or death and to fight back. There, there's nothing that a, a pig can do to stop that. There's nothing that a, uh, a army ranger can do to stop that. There's nothing that the National Guard, people going to fight back regardless. Uh, fight or fight. Basic and so if you want to actually save lives, you should be for free housing, free education, uh, quality health care, and start to figure out what you can do as a person to contribute to that. And I'll offer you getting involved in people's programs because that's what we pushing. You know, a lot of groups are, be anti-police, but they're not anti-capitalism. A lot hmm. of folks will be um, anti, yeah, a lot of, people, a lot of folks claim they pro-restorative uh, justice, you know, that they're abolitionists, but they're not anti-capitalist. I don't, uh, you know, we again, I'll say that that's a byproduct of uh, either not properly understanding the historical development of this nation's institutions and ideologies and how the economic system is the uh, foundation for all those things or you are actually trying to mislead people and find yo you know in into the system of a fascism right that's what i would chalk that up to but um we mentioned some businesses and i don't want to take away from our analysis on crime but i think this is a key question for us to ask because uh I think people like to say because they have their businesses in Oakland that they're investing into the community. And me and you were talking, like I'm like, there's a difference between uh, a business in the community and a community business. And so could you uh, give your analysis on the difference between the two? Yeah, I would say a community business has actual relationships in the community where there's some type of reciprocation that's happening. It ain't just a business that is meant to only make money only make capital, only drive up their own pockets, but it's a business that, you know, will support the community in different initiatives, whether it's sponsoring youth football teams. Uh, I can give even, like, real examples of, I I say Marcus Books. Marcus Books is one of the oldest, I believe the oldest black bookstore uh, in the country, you know what I'm saying, where they have been, you know, making money, but also supporting the community, right? So, for example, I know when protests have happened, they've, you feel me, bailed out protesters. 
they've supported community initiatives. You know what I'm saying? Uh, a more recent example is uh, what Prime, right? Mm-hmm. Prime got, you know, in the winter, they got, you know, all they shit took. You feel me? They got broken into and robbed. And they're like, okay, how can we make something positive happen? You feel me? And what do they say? They say, all right, well, let's uh, work with people's programs and get donations. And some of the donations, and then the donations will go to the people in the streets. You feel me? People who are also. So that's like actual, like a reciprocal relationship. You feel me? Where there's actual uh, positive things happening for uh, both ends. You know what I'm saying? You ain't just getting money like, oh, I'm in this side. Well, I only care about making money. You're actually doing things for the community. You're doing things for the people. You see, your, you see yourself as a part of a broader a broader people. <laughs> you feel me? Uh, uh, business in the community is just the business in the community. <laughs> you shake shack. <laughs> or just a, a local owned business that's just, you feel me? Oh, we're just about to make money. We aren't. You know, we might use language like, oh, we care about community. We care about Oakland. But, nah, you care about making money. Like, like that's what the have you, Some thing. of these places, I'm like, like. what have you done on some real, sh- you know. I told you I Google things- such, such and such backpack drive, like the low level shit. You know, like backpack drive is super easy. Such and such toy giveaway. Not seeing none of this. And that's just like low level, pretty so liberal we can say, things. You know, exactly. We can say, okay, yeah, you might enjoy eating at this food and not, you know what I'm saying? But, like. What have they done for you? Yeah, nothing but take what my have money. they done for people? You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, oh my gosh, this community institution. What makes it a community institution? Just because you ate good food there? Or just because you shopped there? It makes it a, a pivotal community institution? Or is a community institution one that works with the community and is a part of the community to, to develop positive change and positive action? You feel me? Versus just being exploitive. So... Let's well, just, you know, I think we have to understand the difference, right? Community business, being locked in with the community, supporting the people, you know, uh, making money, but also being a part of, seeing themselves as a part of the movement. You feel me? Setting up hubs for donations, setting up hubs to be able to support different community programs, you know what I'm saying? Sponsoring youth teams, you know, being like, we know the people who are out there because they're out there. Like, Yo, Barber, you feel me? Community business. You feel me? A thousand percent. Pulling up, bringing waters. <laughs> you feel me? Early on in the breakfast program. Like it was nothing. Yeah. And people know that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like that that relationship is established mm-hmm. versus someone just, hey, man, you're going to, <laughs> I'm back in the you're going to Great Clips and just, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's all good. We sponsored our, uh, our, well, my Pee Wee football team because my boy uh, Terrell, the owner's son, was on our team and he sponsored our bags. You feel me? Like, there's ways, you know what I'm saying, to that play a a role. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying. So versus just a okay, this is a, a place where I come eat and you take my money and you do nothing for me but distract me from the ills of capitalism. You do Shit. nothing to restore my humanity to contribute to my well being. Somebody said, "Oh, I, I, that's me feeding you, like, nigga." All right, I pay for that. I pay for that. <laughs> now you you're like, right, man. trying to get niggas drunk and all. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. Like, what, what are we talking about? Staple in the community. Staple bro. in the community. No, it's you, you're a liquor store. And that's why I would say you got to start <laughs> questioning, like, what are, what are these people's <laughs> motives? You feel me? Like, what do you actually do for us besides take our money uh, and give us these, you know, wage, uh, wage jobs? But, you know. Yeah. But I, I think one thing I hope people get away is, like, the sincerity that we have. Of wanting to actually have things change and wanting people to be safe, you feel me? That's why the work we do is like, hey man, we we just trying to build a nation where we govern ourselves, where we remove the heel of white uh, white supremacy of capitalist imperialism off of our necks. You know what I'm saying? Where we take it uh, off of us to where we can actually, by now, we could determine our own interests. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, I think one thing we've seen, especially locally, like we've seen uh, uh, folks from Oakland. Um, voice displeasure with people who might live in Oakland but not be from Oakland speak on the changes that need to be made. Uh, what are your thoughts on folks not from the town and the role they play here? Well, like I recognize the sentiment of folks who have lived here, whose families have come here as part of the first and second grade migrations and have been here for, you know, 70, 50, 60 years. I recognize the sentiment, right? Uh, because... I recognize that, uh, and in my experience, folks that have lived here for such a long time tend to be actually more invested in the um, well-being of this place. Uh, but then I've also seen some folks, you know, who have been here and are also invested in 
uh, milking this community for their own personal gains. And so I say, well, I recognize in both those things, you know, I try to take a more uh, a France Fanon ideology and outlook at to like, uh, you know, anybody who's in Oakland and is truly invested in seeing the entire community have their basic needs met and put in a position where they can uh, empower themselves truly. And I mean, empower means changing your relationship to the means of production, changing your relationship to property, changing yourself, changing your relationship to other people. I think anyone who is in Oakland is dedicated and dedicated to that should have a, a opinion on what goes on in Oakland. But I think the amount of work that you put in, uh, for me personally, validates your, your opinion. Uh, and if your analysis is rooted in a true communal egalitarian, uh, anti-capitalist analysis, then I consider you a part of my, the community that I'm trying to build in Oakland. Uh, and I don't think that being from Oakland automatically qualifies you for that. And, you know, I don't think not being from Oakland automatically disqualifies you. It's like Fanon said, anybody that's in Algeria, uh, in this new Algeria, this communal, uh, egalitarian, free, sovereign, loving, hardworking Algeria is an Algerian. Whether they are, were born here, whether they're like Fernand and from Martinique, whether they're uh, a fucking uh, uh, expatriated Frenchman, you know, like if you hear and you believe in seeing this nation, these people live full lives, then you can be here. And I, I think that same approach, that same ideology, that same belief, that same practice could be applied here. But there's people who, legacy organizers, right? I was in the Panthers. I did this, I did that. And who went away? Who are tools for fascism? Shoot, though. You feel me? Former police chief, where he from? You know, like, that's how you get, like, oh, Armstrong. You know, he's from Oakland. Nigga, he's the top pig in the city. I don't care where he from. I don't <laughs> care. Is he put, you feel me? Like, is he doing anything to actually, we keep talking about making Oakland safe, and that's what we're going to, you know, gonna kind of be like the last question to wrap it up. But, like, what are you doing besides being a tool for this specific system? And a person can't know if they're a tool for this specific system if they don't have analysis, an analysis on this system. And so uh, I think as it pertains to uh, new Africans, who you know, black people who want to make sense of if they're a tool for this system, you know, we had a person that says they appreciate when we give these books and that they go on and read them. I would say you need to read We Are Own Liberators by Jalil Muntakin, where he talks about uh, neocolonialism, right? Uh, this new form of colonialism that makes the people feel like they are free, right? We as Africans, part of our neo-colonial, new, as Africans in America, part of our neo-colonial uh, experience was reconstruction and the suffrage and uh, the civil rights movement. And then in present day, Barack Obama and uh, who is it? Is it Lloyd Austin, who is the fucking uh, secretary of defense, right? These things, Kamala Harris, uh, these things are a part of neocolonialism where you start to think that you're free because you have more uh, participation in this exploitative system, right? So for people who want to know if they're a pawn of it and want to be able to recognize pawns, read Jalil Mutakins, we are, we are Own Liberators. We read Kwame Nkrumah's uh, Class Struggle in Africa because that book can be applied to any place in the world. Uh, and so, yeah, we got to start recognizing it. And I think being able to recognize neocolonialism will start you'll be able to recognize it in your own locale, especially in these locales that are historically, uh, you know, black, like Oakland, like, you know, Hunter's Point, where you get a little, you know, now you got London Bree, is the mayor of San Francisco, uh, shit, Atlanta, right? <sighs> Milwaukee, all these places that's talking about building these cop cities and shit, you know, you should get real familiar because these black folks will be the pawns uh, that make you feel like because they look like you, because they from where you from, they've experienced some of the things you've experienced, that they got your best interests at heart. And we know that ain't true. No, that ain't true. So thinking about safety, you feel me? What is things that we can do, you know, uh, to actually ensure the safety of people in Oakland? And what are some of these things that, you know, businesses businesses can do to do that as well? You know, just think about how we just talked about some of these business owners, owners you know? I mean, I think you should expand on um, the decolonization programs and how these create real safety. Or I think you expanding on that will be super helpful. Yeah, I mean, programs for decolonization, they have to be the heartbeat of the community. You feel me? They are the material support, the material action, uh, the shifting of consciousness to be able to actually govern ourselves and to develop self-determination, to de develop political autonomy, social autonomy, economic autonomy uh, from our oppressor government, right? 
programs for decolonization, what they effectively do is divorce ourselves from this neo-colonial relationship with the state and instead invest in the relationship with the people where we have our own infrastructure, right? So uh, People's Breakfast Oakland, that is being, that is developed as a program for decolonization, that is developing infrastructure to be able to feed houseless people in Oakland. We know that if people is hungry, what is the material effect of hunger going to do on a person? You know what I'm saying? Our grocery program in Acorn and, uh, and broader West Oakland as well, right? Uh, if people don't have groceries, you feel me? If people don't, again, have food, uh, what's the result of that going to be, right? So this program, not only is it providing a material resource, but it's also exposing the contradictions of capitalism while also getting the people who we are serving involved in the political machine of the program for decolonization to where the people can then develop their own community liberation associations uh, to be able to develop their own destiny and to be able to develop these, you know, autonomous communities to where they're tied into a political organization, tied into... uh, true organizing that is actually going to benefit themselves, their family, <laughs> and their local community, right? So having that uh, infrastructure being built and invested into rather than the infrastructure that is already existing that is uh, only can run with our exploitation is what is needed to advance uh, actual unity in our community, right? Because if we don't have unity, we are going to continue to look at ourselves like we are the enemy and not actually to be able to actually point out who the real enemy is in our community. You feel me? So that is why the program for decolonization uh, is so important because it becomes this material lifeline, but also it moves our people forward in a way to be able to see like, okay, if these people are here day in and day out trying to build with us, why, why ain't the government doing this for us? It exposes the nature. And if these people are trying to do this, why don't we just govern ourselves, right? So essentially these programs for decolonization, it garners all of the positive energy and positive momentum in the community and moves us forward in a way to where we're able to actually determine our own destiny. And I think that's a good point because you're making, well, good points. You're making people think again, like what is true safety? And for us, I asked the question, Okay, if all robbery stopped, would that make you feel safe about being possibly fired from your job at any given moment? If all robbery stopped, would you feel safe about the stocks dropping and you losing all your retirement like what happened at Enron? If all the robbery stopped, right, would you feel safe about being pulled over uh, and being shot in your car or the police kicking in your door and shooting you in bed like Breonna Taylor? If all the robbery stopped, would you feel safe about getting cancer uh, and not being able to afford the treatments? How do, like, We got to talk about true safety because we can eradicate that problem real quick. Lock up all the niggas who doing robberies. Lock them all up. Put them all police on the streets. How does that solve these whole other areas of problems that are birthed from this economic system of capitalism? What is true safety under this? We on a month-to-month lease. They could come knock on the door right now and be like, hey, you got 30 days, you got to cut. Ain't anything can happen. Your old job, well, they could just hit you and say you lost all your 401k. What can you do about it? Nothing. You can get sick right now. You know, as much as we stress, get sick right now. I broke out in hives last month. I had to go to the ER, $1,000 hospital bill. Come on, man. We talk, don't talk about safety. <laughs> How about a nigga robbing me? Shit. How about a nigga robbing me? Come on. What, what what true safety are we talking about here? And that's what, you know, that's how they distract you. Again, they engineer your concern about certain problems. And they're engineering your consciousness. They're engineering your emotions. You feel me? But you claiming you free? Come on. And so what is true safety? And the true safety we talking about is uh, the ability to work and contribute to a society, not being unemployed. Uh, the ability to know that if you get sick, you'll be taken care of. Uh, the ability to get a quality education. This is true safety. And how does police... True safety means not fucking selling yourself to somebody else like we is doing every single how day. How is crime preventing you from doing that? <laughs> and how are the police... How will the police uh, allow you to do those things? Yeah. To contribute to society, to have health care, to have housing. You know? And these are questions that need answers, man. Hella black. We're trying to build these answers. Come to people's programs. Yes, sir. Volunteer. 
can't volunteer, build your consciousness and donate to the program. <laughs> Hello Black 145.